uh, within the stage. So uh, welcome everybody to the to the webinar uh, to the uh, webinar. And uh, the speaker of today is Katepadi uh, uh, Stenivasan. I hope I pronounce it properly. And the topic of today is turbulence and circulation. So I quickly introduce him. So he was dean at the New York University Kano School of Engineering. He is the he was the past president of the Brooklyn Polytechnic and. Uh, uh, the former director of the International Center of Theoretical Physics in uh, Trieste, Italy. At uh, New York uh, University, he is a university professor with professorship in the Department of Physics and uh, the current Institute of uh, Mathematical Sciences. Uh, he is also a Eugene uh, Kleiner uh, Chair of uh, Innovation at the New York University School of Engineering. Uh, Professor uh, Stanley Vassan uh, has uh, won several prizes and awards for the impact of his research, and he's a member of the National Academy of Science and the National Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Science, and belongs to several other academy, uh, academies internationally. So it's uh, with great, great pleasure that I introduce uh, um, uh, Professor Sveni Vassan for, uh, for his talk. Sveni, I give you the, the stage. Okay, I thank you. I'll uh, share screen. Yeah, we can see your presentation. Okay, thank you. So, um, Francesco, uh, thank you for inviting me and uh, congratulations on the uh, the webinar that you've been organizing with um, various people from different places, different topics. And it's uh, very nice to be able to be part of this. So I'm uh, very thankful to you. <clears throat> so, um, a version of the talk that I am going to give today has uh, probably already appeared in YouTube. I'm not sure. I haven't checked, uh, but uh, I gave a, a similar talk and they asked me whether they could put it up on YouTube. So, if you see it somewhere, uh, please know that this is not 100% new. Um, so what uh, is it that I want to talk about? I want to talk about uh, turbulence in some specific uh, aspect of it. I just saw there may be some one or two people who don't know what I have in mind. Um, um, when the Reynolds number is very large, uh, whatever that very large means, uh, many scales of motion are excited. This uh, we know in a fluid flow. And the problem of turbulence is to understand and predict the motion of the entire range of scales statistically. Even those who work on structures and so on sometimes confuse that they are doing deterministic problem, but that's not true. Everything is uh, statistical and uh, different types of statistics apply to different aspects. So in fact, what I would uh, mostly focus on there uh, is What's happened since uh, July 1941 when Kolmogorov wrote his first paper on uh, turbulence? That was 80 years ago, uh, give or take a little bit. And uh, what uh, might be happening beyond that? So uh, that is uh, my goal for today. I will, of course, not go through the whole thing, but only in some uh, limited way. So let's start with the so-called uh, uh, zeroth law of turbulence. Actually, um, now I know that uh, I was the one who introduced that uh, term. Uh, um, I had forgotten about that. Or it's also called dissipative anomaly. What is the anomaly? Uh, let me explain that. So you have Navier-Stokes equations, which you can write it for the energy. And then you have a term uh, that is the energy dissipation rate. And this typically has the structure that it has viscosity, kinematic viscosity times the square of the gradients, velocity gradients. And uh, naively, one might think that when uh, viscosity goes to zero, <clears throat> um, the, the dissipation rate goes to zero 
but it remains a constant of the order unity in three-dimensional turbulence. That's why I call turbulence a super dissipator. Uh, it is anomaly because the Euler symmetry is not restored, Euler symmetry being no dissipation, is not restored even when the symmetry breaking parameter nu tends to zero. So you have this uh, very interesting phenomenon and the explanation usually has been that, uh, well, when viscosity goes to zero, the gradient squared, they just increase uh, in the right proportion. So the product of one large and one very small term is just finite. So it's a kind of boundaryless structure, but it doesn't tell you anything really more than just what the words imply. And this is not a new idea or anything like that. Um, the first mention of this, as far as I know, is G.I. Taylor, uh, who simply stated this without any prelude to uh, this notion coming from previous sentences or, um, or uh, any other work. He simply stated that the energy dissipation rate, when you normalize by the, uh, the large velocity and the large length scale, we call it D, is of order unity. And um, Kolmogorov uh, made an attempt to show this from the equations. I say made an attempt because uh, it was not completely uh, uh, satisfactory, but it is important. He made a very important uh, effort. And um, the, the point is that if you take the limit of D, that is the thing I wrote down here, as viscosity goes to zero, call it D star, it's a water unity. So that's the so-called dissipative anomaly, or a very important thing for turbulence, and uh, therefore called it zeroth law. It's reminiscent of the constant drag coefficient behind uh, bluff bodies, etc. but I will only consider homogeneous and isotopic turbulence here. Actually, Stavros Stavlaris gave a talk on this topic in this series, and uh, he started with this and he went on in uh, many different directions. But for me, uh, I, I, this is uh, just, a, uh, just a reference point. Now, um, the evidence for this was not clear until uh, this paper in 1984, where I plot D as a function of Reynolds number, the microscale Reynolds number, if you like, are one over the viscosity. So as you go from left to right, the viscosity is going down or the Reynolds number is going up. Initially, there is a dependence on the, on, uh, on the viscosity or the Reynolds number, but thereafter it seems to settle down to a constant of our unity. This is an experimental uh, thing and this low Reynolds number limit can be worked out <coughs> exactly. And then uh, there is a, a very nice formula by Doring and Fayash. Uh, so I'm glad to see uh, Charlie here, uh, where they have this expression, which actually fits the data quite well. And uh, this, is, this behavior is true even for simulations, uh, which is uh, sort of interesting because the conditions for experiments and simulations are not the same, although they're both trying to do homogeneous and isotropic turbulence. Again, you have the same type of behavior, and uh, this uh, the difference here is due to uh, different uh, forcing conditions and so and so on. <clears throat> and uh, since that time, there have been a number of attempts. Um, Canada, for instance, and, um, and Diego, with whom I worked, and Peter Young, uh, uh, PK Young, with whom I worked as well. And uh, this has been extended in different directions <clears throat> by different people. Christos uh, Vasilikos wrote a, a paper, annual reviews paper, which uh, elaborated on this uh, even more. But I want to talk a little bit about what people think these days about the theoretical underpinning of, uh, of this. Um, so one of the most interesting ideas that uh, uh, is, uh, is often discussed as an explanation for this is the is due to Ansager's conjecture, which was made in 1949. It has, uh, roughly speaking, two statements. One is that the dissipative weak Euler solutions 
have holder exponents which are less than or equal to one third. So weak solutions of either equations with holder exponents which are less than or equal to one third are dissipative. And that is the first statement, what are holder exponents? If you take the velocity difference between two neighboring points for small uh, distance between them, instead of it being linearly proportional to R, <clears throat> as would be the case for smooth uh, um, vari variables, it would go like R to the power H, where H is not a uh, not unity. And uh, th those are the holder exponents. And Anselm was talking about uh, exponents less than or equal to one third. And uh, this thing has been uh, shown to be true. I mean, there have been a number of people who have shown, uh, who worked on this uh, a lot for quite a while. And uh, the uh, most recent work is due to, due to these people and some others perhaps, but I just wrote them as examples. So that part of the uh, statement of Ansaga's conjecture is true. But there's another part to it, and that is these weak solutions of the, um, of the Euler equations are somehow uh, responsible for the finiteness of energy dissipation for Navier-Stokes turbulence as viscosity tends tends zero. Now, this is a very different statement from the first part because you don't know the connection between the two. So I would say this part of the statement is not proven, although uh, there have been, as an, another example, for instance, Theo Drivas wrote an interesting paper in General Nonlinear Science a few years ago. But people are thinking about this, and I think there will be a time when we will know um, this thing uh, pretty nicely. Now, that's the first thing, and that's very important for Kolmogorov's, the uh, rest of the Kolmogorov's theory, which is the purpose of uh, my showing this. And what exactly did uh, Kolmogorov say? I write it in slightly different notation. Um, he said that if you take the velocity difference between two neighboring points, which is what we considered already, and I call that UR, if you take the, uh, if you take the uh, uh, variance of this, I forgot to put um, the average sign on this, it will go like epsilon R to the power two thirds times a function which is uh, uniquely dependent on R or eta, where eta is the Kolmogorov scale given by that. That's nominally the smallest scale in, uh, in turbulence, although I will discuss that uh, later. We know this much better in this form, which is the Fourier transform relation corresponding to this, that the spectral density is proportional to k to the power minus five thirds, and a function of um, k eta, and when k eta is, uh, is uh, large, uh, then this argument is large, this function becomes a, a constant, and so you have the minus uh, five-thirds. And uh, <clears throat> what is not uh, spelt out very often, but is important for this, um, is that the length scale of the fluctuations has this form, it's epsilon r to the one third times another universal function of r over eta. So those are the two uh, main statements of uh, Kolmogorov. And <coughs> you might recall that uh, many years later, 20, almost 25 years later, uh, critical scaling was uh, much discussed. And it is the same thing when you have a phase transition, for example, taking place due to a field H, then the free energy can be written like this, and the length scale can be written like this, universal functions here, and uh, well-known power laws here, uh, where this little p is the uh, distance from the critical temperature in this case. And these are universal constants, and there is a, a, a definite relation among these uh, constants uh, as well. So there is a universality, and this has been established, it has been very successful paradigm, especially after the renormalization group was invented, uh, theory was invented in 1979, uh, it got the Nobel Prize. Now, um, I want, what Kolmogorov said was for second order moments, but you can sort of extend it to uh, many orders. So suppose I want to consider the pth order, p being a number which is uh, very large or very small, 
and larger the PE, I am emphasizing the more and more intense fluctuations in delta um, R of U. So uh, if I want to know how the intense uh, fluctuations in, uh, in delta R U behave, I just need to look at the tails of the distribution or higher and higher moments, which is the purpose of, uh, of writing it like this. And just extending it, if the second moment goes like two thirds, um, you, you might say that the pth moment goes like p thirds. And of course, I've, I've not said anything about this universal function because I'm looking at the inertial range where r over eta is very large. And therefore, uh, this function where, whose argument goes to infinity just becomes a, a constant. That's an assumption. And the only part we know is that the, uh, when p is three, we have, uh, we have this relation. Now, um, what has been the observation from mid 1980s, for instance, um, when Ansel met and his uh, collaborators uh, made the first uh, measurements of this, that if you actually compute these exponents, instead of being P over three, they're, uh, they're, uh, it's, a, it's a, a, a function of P. And this function of P is not a linear function. And because it is a nonlinear function, you don't know how uh, one uh, point on the graph relates to the other unless you know what the nonlinear function is. And therefore, if you want to know what the behavior of this, uh, this uh, object is for different orders of P, you have to study uh, that object for, for each P, that is infinite, infinite number of um, moments like this is what you need or the entire probability density. Instead of, if it were a Gaussian, you would only know the variance and then the distribution would be known uh, entirely. It's very far from that. And that is in fact uh, also very different from what you have here. And therefore that is one direction in which this has been seen to be as an important problem. And um, I want to connect it to what uh, Cole McGraw said in 1941. This is an um, uh, important aspect of uh, the a theory. And as I said here, the exponent of R to P depends on the moment R to P nonlinearly. And this is the multifractality of, of um, uh, turbulence as, um, uh, in terms of velocity differences. Now, what do we know? I will uh, say, uh, look at this first and then look at uh, this next. Uh, look at, trying to look for this thing first. Um, uh, by the way, this is supposed to be universal because it does not depend on the large scale or the large velocity scale, and uh, therefore it's supposed to be universal. So a few comments uh, on the data with which I will analyze and I will look for all these things uh, here. Um, first, I will use direct numerical simulations data in a periodic box, which gives me enormous flexibility. And so that's a periodic box. And um, the largest periodic box that we have looked at has a size 18,432 cube. Although I will use uh, 8,192 cube most often. And the box is about five times the integral scale. And the first few wave numbers are forced. And different forcing schemes have been used. And the people with whom I have worked on this are P.K. Young and Diego Donzis, whose students and postdocs I've shared and with whom we have worked. Now, uh, the Reynolds number, the microscale Reynolds number varies from three to 1300. For the highest case, um, it's about, it's the Reynolds number is greater than 10 power five and the number of grid points is more than 10 power 12. So this is about the largest simulations that one can find. Just to compare our first one statement, the range is adequate to address finite Reynolds number effects because I go from three to 1300. I know how things vary with Reynolds number. And this high range of Reynolds number is thought to be high enough because property is saturate. And of course, I don't really know this to be true, but I believe uh, because they saturate, it, they, they're probably independent of the Reynolds number thereafter. And therefore, um, uh, um, uh, the, the asymptotic ones. 
For comparison, let's say that in the experiment in Southern California, wind tunnel, Kistler and Rebowitz experiment on grid turbulence, you may remember this wind tunnel was dismantled in 1968 or something like that. It was a wind tunnel that many aircraft companies had built to test huge models of the aircraft, sometimes full-scale ones. And before it got dismantled, they did two important experiments, one on grid turbulence, one on the, um, the cylinder, circular cylinder. And the test section was this long and this size. And the speed of the flow was 61 meters per second. It was pressurized to four atmospheres. And the highest R lambda there was 520. So you have to sort of compare uh, this with, uh, with what we have DNS. And furthermore, this amazing variable density wind tunnel in Göttingen, which operates uh, um, in a 1.5 square meter cross section at a length of 20 meters using sulfur hexafluoride at 15 atmospheres, it produces Reynolds number R lambda up to 5,000, but turbulence measurements, because the scales get very small, can only be made maybe up to Reynolds number 1,600, as far as I know. And that's quite comparable to what you have in the highest uh, Reynolds number in simulations. And in fact, uh, a higher Reynolds number has been reached in simulations, but I haven't used them for the present purpose. So that's the data. You should not worry about the accuracy of the data, the convergence and this sort of stuff, because this is really done um, as carefully as possible. So let's focus on the other parts of the, the talk. So I want to talk about first the so-called universality of this function f of theta. So uh, the way it is done is you plot um, uh, the uh, measured spectral density as a function of wave number in one dimension here. And uh, you can see that um, there's this part for uh, um, large enough k, k eta. Uh, there is this uh, tendency for a large range of data to fall on top of each other. And of course, with increasing Reynolds number, it peels off from there. And for high Reynolds number, you have minus uh, five thirds power. Uh, re reasonably well established or close enough to five thirds. Now, uh, this is in fact uh, uh, the cover page of uh, statistical fluid mechanics, um, money in agloms, you can see the same thing shown. And this is supposed to be universal, but if you look at it closely, considering the fact that this axis has been compressed enormously, you can actually see that uh, there are at least orders of magnitude differences uh, from one set of experiment to another. And of course, it's very clear from here as well. And in fact, uh, now that a uh, whole uh, lot of uh, computing power is available, you can actually compute it with increasing resolution. You can see that here, you never go beyond uh, 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 smaller scales than uh, eta, um, but you can of course compute them. And uh, what's been done is basically here, so this has been normalized by k to the power five thirds. So you have this flat region, different Reynolds numbers peeling off from this. And you can see that what is supposed to be a universal function is really not. Um, as I said before, all the experimental data sort of lie to the right of this one. Even there, there are differences, but surely there are big differences on this. And the best, best theoretical fit known for this is something like that. And therefore you can uh, compute this quantity. And this, if you plot against k eta, will have to be in, in the universal function, which, is, which it is not. So you can actually see this. And this has been done for many Reynolds numbers by different people, different forcing schemes and so on. So it is pretty clear that that is not the case. And um, what is um, therefore um, true is, appears to be true is that the universality of f of k eta uh, does not hold. And the only way you have some universality attached to it is not when you plot against k eta, but k eta times r lambda to the power minus half. And you get exponential fits. This is something that uh, Charlie Doring probably has worked on as well. Um, uh, but uh, what, what happens is this beta varies with Reynolds number initially, but then saturates to uh, higher values. And the data for this comes from 
uh, Kurshid's um, uh, work, who, who is Diego's student, but he worked with me uh, as well, uh, staying in New, New York uh, several times. So um, the theory for this, I will show in slide 14, which will come uh, naturally at, um, at that point. So basically, uh, the, this says that eta is not the scaling variable, but eta times r lambda to the power minus half, which is a smaller scale than eta. This has some real implications for uh, singularities of Navier-Stokes equations and so on, for which I will give you a, a, a recent uh, a reference later on. Um, if I, yeah, I think I put it in somewhere. So now let's uh, worry about the next part, which is about the power loss, uh, which is uh, the, if you take uh, the speed moment and you want to know if it is a power law in R. So normally you would plot it on a log log scale like this and try to see if there is a straight line um, uh, like that, as in fact appears to be the case for two instances I've shown. Um, but if you want to be a little bit more sophisticated, you want to go and take the local slope of these things. If it is a real power law, then you should see um, constancy attached to them. And in fact, you can see that um, at Reynolds number varies, uh, increases, uh, there is the tendency for the local slope to be approaching a constant and staying constant uh, for increasing scale range here. So uh, even for 1300, there is where there is a scaling range, but it is not an extensive scaling range. It's a, at most of the order uh, decade or less. So the small but definitive range where power loss are indeed valid. Uh, quite often, if you take the Reynolds number far below that, you, you have a tendency to see a power law in this by just uh, by these uh, log log parts, which on closer inspection is somewhat ambiguous, but um, nevertheless, it reflects the same power law as you have here. Now you will do this experiment for different uh, values of P, et cetera, et cetera, and plot uh, the, uh, the slope that you find as a function of the moment order. Uh, P by three is this line, which is the Kolmogorov line. And it's been known for some time, as I said, um, that they deviate from uh, P by three. But this one I present particularly because these have been done uh, most carefully and local slopes have been measured and things like that. And these are the data for the longitudinal um, uh, uh, velocity differences. And uh, they seem to keep going uh, up and up um, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, plot. And um, and uh, these are various models about which I will not say very much. But if you take the transverse um, uh, uh, velocity differences that seem to saturate, and this is the highest Reynolds number, and this is a lower Reynolds number, there seems to be a Reynolds number dependence, perhaps the saturate uh, in Reynolds number as well. So now this is a very important thing, the saturation for the following reason. If saturation is indeed true, if you take uh, this uh, thing that I have already said, the power law in, in R, uh, zeta p being the power law exponent, then you take the one by p moment of, of this, and that will uh, look like this. So R over L to the power zeta p by p. If zeta p saturates as p increases, uh, this quantity is zero, it tends to zero. Therefore, this whole thing is uh, unity. So in fact, what it says is the velocity difference for very intense fluctuations across the scale R is of the R to U naught itself. So this is like in shocks, jumps in velocity across even the smallest distances are on the R of the largest velocity in the flow. Um, so nonlinearity we always know tends to steepen things in fluid dynamics. But what in fluid dynamics contracts that quite often incompressible fluid dynamics is that the pressure tends to uh, tends to slow down this uh, this tendency to to um, uh, to uh, form these um, these uh, jumps, and uh, that's that's why you don't see jumps uh, uh, in most instances. But if you are looking at very extreme events. 
um, which is what I have done when p tends to infinity, very large values, then in fact, the pressure effects become sort of irrelevant or become benign. And you have very huge jumps in, uh, in, uh, in the velocity fluctuations. So that's the moral of the story. And um, at, at some point there was a theory by Victor Yakovt which said even for the longitudinal ones, they saturate and uh, like the transfers themselves. So I was uh, very anxious to see if this is true or not. So although we were only happy up to moment order 12, considering we have an enormous amount of data, and I already said you shouldn't worry about convergence and so on up to there, even though there were some convergence issues for high order moments, I pushed my postdoc, uh, Karthik Iyer, to uh, do this. So I take responsibility for this behavior, which I present to you not as a firm conclusion, but as a likely indication. Perhaps they too saturate um, for very large order moments that I do not know, but I think it would be interesting to know. But this behavior of saturation of exponents which I already mentioned uh, its importance uh, is very similar to what happens in Berger's equations, which is the Navier-Stokes equations without pressure, and also the passive scalars, uh, both for the model due to Craigman and also in real experiments, whose uh, results I show here, which actually saturate very early and for very small values of uh, the exponent. So that's the part that we know uh, to be the case. And uh, now I have come to slide 14, which is where I want to present a little theory of where this, uh, uh, this uh, smallest scale being not eta, but eta times r lambda to the power quarter comes from. And this is the paper which I cite as an illustration of how important it is. As I already said, uh, Charlie and uh, John Gibbons probably have some uh, work on this as well in a slightly different way or I will not uh, cite too much. Um, uh, basically what it, uh, and the conclusion of this paper is that in fact, the, uh, the, um, the singular structure of the uh, weak solutions of Navier-Stokes and Euler can be put, it, put all in uh, one framework and it's related to uh, the smallest scale in the flow, uh, which is, uh, Kolmogorov or finer, and it is finer, uh, certainly like the one I have shown, there are no singularities, which I think is really a very important thing. As you know, there is the Cray Prize uh, that is waiting for a full demonstration of this. So basically the theory is this. So you, you take this velocity difference, as I've said, and, uh, excuse me, um, and uh, so uh, you sort of say that this is valid even if I stretch it all the way to the smallest scale. So I take the uh, smallest scale and um, eta uh, for now. And then uh, eta is defined in such a way that the local Reynolds number based on the, that velocity, the length scale and that velocity difference is unity. So you normally define it for the mean value of eta and the Kolmogorov velocity scale, but they say locally it is true everywhere, but then eta is a, is a field variable, not a fixed number. Therefore, eta is a new over the velocity difference uh, locally, and that means you can write the velocity difference uh, by taking um, the, uh, the velocity gradient as velocity difference across the smaller scale, which gives you this relation, and you take the 2n plus 2n plus month moment and the 2nth moment they are related like this and it's just a one line algebra to show that eta 2n which is the smallest scale uh, for appropriate for the 2nth moment divided by l is Reynolds number to the power of this thing okay when if the exponent saturate that is zeta 2n and zeta 2n plus one are the same these two cancel and I have Reynolds number to the power minus one. So when eta tends to very large values uh, so that this um, saturation is true, then eta uh, infinity, let's say, divided by L is not re to the power minus three quarters, which we always attribute to Kolmogorov scaling. Um, instead, it is Reynolds number to the power minus one or Kolmogorov times Reynolds number to the quarter 
r eta times r lambda to the power minus half. This is the scale I use to get the exponential behavior in my oh, a few slides ago. So that's the smaller scale. The smaller scale is not eta, but eta times r lambda to minus half. As I said, this is probably very important for considering the singularities in the Navier-Stokes. Okay, so I will leave it like that. But the point I want to make simply is that um, many tenets of uh, Kolmogorov's uh, um, formulation uh, have shown have been shown to have limitations. We have known for some time that there is anomalous scaling, that is the scaling exponents not following uh, P03. The work began in mid 90s, but I think we have now very definitive uh, results. Even if some caveats are violated modestly, this anomalous behavior has been demonstrated to be true in many flows. And new aspects that have emerged are different components scale differently, the saturate to different levels, and small scale universality does not hold. So in fact, um, even though these behaviors like saturation of exponents um, and uh, the anomal anomalous scaling, et cetera, are uh, true for a variety of flows and everything, the era of Kolmogorov's universal scaling seems to be over in my opinion, though it continues to inspire us and we take off from uh, where we have uh, been uh, given. So that's the first part of my talk. And now if, uh, that is, um, if that is what it is, what are the other things that you can think about? Uh, maybe if as alternatives, maybe as uh, different uh, views. After all, we have lived with the Kolmograph thing for 80 years. And so it's uh, probably not so bad to think about other things. And so let's look at the circulation around Eulerian loops in 3D turbulence. So I have a loop, um, which is of arbitrary shape for a short time. Um, and I will converge to uh, more regular shapes later on. And this, the loop circumscribe an area A, and that's the contour. So the circulation around the loop of area A, as you know very well, is uh, U dot DL. And this is also the same by Stokes theorem as the um, normal vorticity component. It's very important for uh, things uh, in superfluids. And in fact, there's a very interesting paper that has been uh, written on this uh, very recently, uh, but I will not go into this. Uh, Carlo um, Berenge, who is uh, here, is the world's expert on this. Now, circulation is very important in fluid dynamics. As you know, wingtip vortices, I find this beautiful picture, very huge wingtip vortex. This is for the aircraft that does uh, crop dusting. Um, and this picture was obtained with very deliberate care and everything, so it's not typical. And of course, if you look at the uh, uh, flow behind a circular cylinder, you have uh, these kind of pictures, but even when you have high Reynolds numbers, um, you, we know that there are vertical structures in turbulence, and so circulation is a very important quantity, independent of what I will say. Um, but it is, now I will push this idea a little bit, and in fact, I will first start with the so-called area rule, which is due to Sasha Migdal. Sasha came to this from, uh, um, from uh, quantum field theory, especially uh, about uh, gravitational uh, work, but uh, for us, it's not so important uh, where it came from. So what is the area rule? The area ru rule says that um, no matter what the shape of this contour, as long as the area is the same, the statistical properties of the circulation around this contour are the same. So that's a very interesting uh, um, thing if it is true. And it must say a lot about the uh, uh, kind of statistical structure of turbulence. So um, let's uh, see if we can actually uh, measure this. So we take this uh, huge database we have and uh, you measure the, you take a contour of a, a certain size. And so we take uh, rectangles, uh, in, um, arbitrary shapes become very difficult. So L1 and L2 are the two sides of the rectangle. And we are in the inertial range, uh, which is uh, this many eta squared. The area is the same. So we, we vary the aspect ratio of the, of, uh, the rectangle and you calculate the probability density 
of the circulation. And you see for uh, many different uh, aspect ratios, they fall on top of each other, except these last ones where the probability density is very doubtful or dubious value because they contain only two times 10 power minus 7% of the sample size. So the symbols are explained here, but that's not the important point here. This is for the equivalent um, uh, Gaussian random field with the same uh, two, two, um, uh, two point structure to it. And it has a very different uh, behavior as you can see. Now, so you might conclude that in fact, area rule holds. Um, by the way, this red line is this formula that Sasha calculated and it is basically an exponential modulated by a square root of uh, gamma. Um, so it almost is exponential towards the tails. You might think the area rule actually holds, <coughs> but um, you know this thing is very compressed as you can see. So in fact, we will look at it a little bit more carefully. And that's the database and uh, this is a reference and uh, I said these averages are performed of, mean realizations, extreme statistical convergence, please don't worry about it for now. Um, those are the references. Uh, but Polikov, such a Polikov made uh, a very uh, well-known particle theorist, uh, made an, an observation <clears throat> that if you calculate the second order moment of uh, gamma, which is this, ui uj uh, is, the, uh, is the second order tensor. And in the inertial range, you write it like, like this, because this is the power law that I talked about. You put it in there. You can see that the circulation depends um, on zeta two, that is the second order scaling exponent. But there are factors in front sitting here that could depend on the, on the circulation contour. And therefore, in fact, you might say that you not only have a dependence on this universal exponent, but also on constants that are sitting in front that may not be universal, may depend on the shape of the loop, et cetera. So you think that therefore the second order will have, um, will might have um, a dependence on uh, perimeter and therefore the area rule might not be true. So let's look at that. Uh, this is a formula I will use later on to compute in the next slide. So let's look at this one. So what is plotted here is this aspect ratio of the rectangle, L1 and L2 are the two sides. One is where we have the square, which is sitting right in the middle of the inertial range. As I go to one side of the inertial range, this square becomes a rectangle. And if I go to the other side of the, uh, other side of the inertial range from the middle, uh, that too becomes a rectangle, but it'll be long side vertical by isotropy, of course, they two must be the same. And they are in fact the same, this has been checked too. So this, this curve that I, have, that I have shown will have a symmetric behavior on the other side. So what is plotted here is this quantity, the circulation around the contour C around this rectangle of a given aspect ratio, raised to the power 2m over one over 2m, uh, uh, normalized by the value for the square. If in fact the area rule is correct, then this ratio must be unity for all possible contours uh, or all possible uh, aspect ratios. Focusing first on, uh, on these uh, dark uh, square, uh, circles, which is when the, we are looking at second order, what you see is in fact, it is not a constant. It does depend on the aspect ratio, just as uh, Sasha was thinking about. And in fact, the, 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 um, the line here is for the, uh, is for the Gaussian random field. The two has a dependence. And the dashed line here is the formula that I had shown you in the previous slide. So in fact, it, they all agree with each other. So in fact, the, uh, the, it's, the area rule is not exactly right. Uh, but the differences are relatively small. As you can see, these are very, small uh, de deviations from one uh, for higher and higher order moments. And for um, and uh, from going two to four, there's a difference four to six, six to eight and eight to 10, 10 to 12, et cetera, about which I'll say a little bit in a moment. 
especially if you normalize the circulation by its own uh, root mean square, which is what is done here for uh, uh, GRF, that is the Gaussian random field, it is constant equal to unity. But for circulation in Navier-Stokes uh, equations is not unity, but it is different from unity by a little bit. And this little bit is actually quite important. And therefore, uh, let's uh, look at it a little bit more. So let's take the mth moment of this. I use uh, for now, for simplicity of uh, analytic calculations, uh, this, uh, this uh, power law behavior, the exponential behavior that I already pointed out to you. So what you find is that, um, is that uh, you can integrate it out and you have a gamma function m of uh, m plus uh, half, which is an uh, analytical function, analytical known function. So you can take the ratio, um, uh, this ratio, m uh, to the power one over, one over m, n to the power one over n. So you take the logarithmic difference of this ratio, and you can simply work out uh, this by, uh, by uh, uh, law of large uh, numbers, etc., and you will find a formula that is independent of all these prefactors, this alpha, this uh, beta that characterize the exponential behavior, etc., but depends only on m and n, and that is the essence of uh, this uh, universality, and this would be true because I've used uh, a lot of large numbers m and n are large, so this is true only for the tails of the distribution. So essentially what it means that the tails of the PDF are universal, and this is the essence of the area rule. So the low order moments, in fact, are not, um, but the high order moments tend to be, and they are different from the Gaussian random field. Um, now let me just see, uh, maybe I'll skip this one and go to uh, what happens if, in fact, the loop are like this, figure eight loops. Um, so suppose I go along this contour like this, the area in this loop is to my left, which means it will have one sign, circulation will have one sign, and I come around and then I go around here, the area is to my right, which is circulation of another sign. So if I want to do the calculations, should I use circulation, should I sum the circulation of these two loops uh, algebraically or simply arithmetically? Uh, because of the sign issue. So if in fact, I will not go through this, but if the scalar area matter, that is you sort of add them arithmetically, you should expect a two thirds power for the, uh, for the circulation squared. And if it is a vector uh, thing, it should be one third. And this is very easy to check. One third and two thirds are not little differences. And in fact, what you find is very nicely the two thirds power or a, a considerable range of scales and uh, for this Reynolds number and for these aspect ratios going from one to 16. And therefore a, a scalar area rule uh, obviously holds. And what if the, uh, a, the areas are non-planar? I always considered so far um, uh, rectangles and squares in a plane, but what if in fact the uh, the loop uh, that I want to consider is like this one uh, here. Um, it's the, uh, if you open up your laptop, it is like this. So that's the same, I call this soccer gate in uh, our paper. And uh, if you consider the area, that the minimal surface that is appropriate to this configuration, that it's like a soap, soap film that attaches to all of these and has the minimal area that can uh, do that. For, um, and so if the area rule is right, the circulation around this minimal area and the equivalent planar area, the area in the plane, which has the same area as the, as the soap film, for instance, then the circulation statistics must be identical. So you can do this. So we actually did this uh, minimal area thing and it takes some work, but you can do this. And what you find is that if you plot the circulation, um, the, the minimal, the non-planar areas are these open symbols, which are here, and the planar areas with the same area uh, are these, and in fact, there are differences. Now, however, if you normalize them by the appropriate uh, moments, that, so you are not presenting it as gamma C 
divided by some large scale value or viscosity, for instance, uh, whatever you choose. Uh, unlike that, I have norm I'm normalizing by the by the its own variance or moments. And in fact, you can see that for, if I do it for second order, uh, pretty much uh, the entire PDF except for the large tails is covered. But if I use the eighth moment, then you see that they are in fact much better behaved towards the tails. So what it says is that the uh, the area rule is true for non-planar ones only if you normalize appropriate internal variable. And again, the tails are better behaved um, for higher order moments. So that's the essence, as I said, of um, the area rule. Now I'm going to just look at uh, squares and I'm going to look at this anomalous scaling, which I showed you before for the velocity differences, uh, where you remember I had to deal with zeta p, which is a, a function uh, which has infinite number of variables for infinite numbers of p's, um, values of p. And what happens if I do that for squares? I'm going to use only squares because I already showed you for rectangles, they are not that different. So I'm going to get these scaling exponents by doing these log log plots. And again, as I said, I could take the local slopes, which I've done here. And the local slopes, as you can see for a second order are constant, very, very well. Um, and this line is the Kolmogorov value. And the fourth order, not so bad. And the line again is Kolmogorov. Sixth order, again, not so bad, and deviates from the Kolmogorov, deviates more from the Kolmogorov for the eighth order, et cetera. Now I uh, plot, um, plot, so the exponents are close to K41, that's Kolmogorov 41 for small p, but fall below K41, although not by very much. So I'm going to plot those exponents as a function of p. You remember, this is the one for which you got the nonlinear function for the velocity differences. For circulation, it's on one line for uh, values of p below this, another straight line uh, for values above this. So in fact, <clears throat> what this says is that this is a Kolmogorov or space filling uh, structure up to a certain order in p, and thereafter it is some other uh, fractal set, but is non-space filling, but different from uh, non-space filling uh, because it deviates from this line. For, that's what. I would say. So this delta p is the difference, and uh, we can talk about how this difference changes as a function of Reynolds number, all of this stuff. What happens is that as you go uh, to higher and higher Reynolds number, this curve shifts in parallel um, uh, 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 beyond a certain point, but uh, below a certain point, they begin to uh, converge onto this line more and more. So higher and higher order p's will have um, uh, higher and higher Reynolds numbers will have higher and higher order P following the Kolmogorov line. And thereafter, it just becomes a line parallel to this with smaller deviation than is shown here. So you have a very simple structure for circulation now, unlike the very complicated structure one has for velocity um, differences. And uh, that I think is a very important thing um, potentially. So in, instead of a function, which nominally is associated with an infinite number of values, here I basically have two constants. And uh, this one is very well known. And in fact, what I'm saying is potentially that if the Reynolds number goes up further and further, larger and larger order moments fall on Kolmogorov line. And uh, there will always be some deviation if you go to higher and higher order moments. So let me uh, summarize uh, what I, I have. I think uh, that's about time anyway. So the final comments are, the universal form proposed by Kolmogorov does not work for structure functions or, sec or moments of the velocity differences, but it continues to remain inspirational. And in fact, it can be used very well for low order moments as a very good approximation. And uh, in fact, that would be fine. But for higher order moments, uh, the fluctuations are such that, in fact, the, if you use the Kolmogorov prescription, it, you will come, it can come to a, a wrong conclusion. Uh, for example, even for the smallest, uh, veloc smallest length scale, you might have the largest possible velocity excursions across it. The scaling, um, which is this anomalous scaling, 
um, is uh, very rich, much richer than what was thought initially in the early days. It's, it saturates, the exponent saturate. And in fact, different components scale differently and saturate at different values. And this actually means that it is not as simple as it was thought, even the anomaly. And the pressure effects uh, have benign influence for very large um, variations in velocity. And it appear possible to take all this into account. And this is something I've been working on with the Victor Accord, but I will not say anything about it now. Circulation appears as a quite a promising variable. Certainly it is of very imp great importance for aerodynamics and fluid dynamics in general, and even for geophysical um, uh, um, uh, variables. Now, um, uh, for circulation, the area rule holds for the tails, and the circulation exponents seem to lie on a bifractal set, that is one set for small values and one set for larger values. So what it means is um, low excursions in the probability density have one type of universality and the higher order ones have another type of universality, but they're both extremely simple. Uh, I posed it as a question. I already commented on this, but in increasingly high Reynolds number, will the circulation eventually become Kolmogorov-like? Uh, because as I said, the more and more uh, P's tend to, P values uh, tend to fall on the Kolmogorov line. The problem of exponents, if that is true, would be resolved in the simplest possible way. And uh, perhaps we have something very nice to handle. So that's uh, really my uh, presentation. Thank you very much for your uh, patience. So thank you very much for, for this uh, very comprehensive presentation. And uh, I would say, uh, I, I'm sure it's, it's gonna trigger a lot of questions. So I would say, let's, uh, let's open the stage for questions if you're- Let me stop sharing, okay? Yes, sure. Yeah. So whoever has questions, just feel free to unmute your mic and, uh, uh, and ask your question. Yes, hello, this is uh, Béranger Dubrun. Hi, you... how, are, how are you doing? Nice to uh, see you. Very nice. Uh, I, have, um, I have one question actually, what is the slope of delta P? You did not mention it. You know the, the deviation, the... Since it's a bifractal, there are two slopes. So one is a false. Yeah, um, I did not mention. Um, I have forgotten what it is. I can send you the slope. Uh, okay. um, I'm sorry, I just uh, didn't write it down. Okay. I don't remember. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It gives um, a dimension of um, something like 2.5 or 6 something, but I just don't remember. I'll send okay. it to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Yes, some, some more questions. So if I may, may I ask another question? I don't want to monopolize, but uh, oh, <laughs> one more question, I'm ready to ask. Yeah, sure. um, you, you spoke about this, this smaller land scale in turbulence, you know, that yes. is, uh, that yeah. is yeah. not Kolmogorov. Yeah. So then it, it means that when we solve numerical simulation, we, we must not yes. stop at Kamax eta equal one okay. or two, but right. go, yes. go higher. Yes. Uh, yes. Is, it, is it actually what, what was done in this uh, very large resolution uh, thing that you did? Was the K new small scale? So, uh, yeah. Um, not all of them have uh, have uh, been done like that, but there are uh, parts of the of the uh, whole data set for which we have resolved uh, one tenth Kolmogorov scalar flow Reynolds number, etc. It becomes um, not as good as you go to higher and higher Reynolds numbers. There's some parts <clears throat> that have been resolved to better than Kolmogorov scale, and some just to Kolmogorov scale, and for the inertial range. It didn't seem to matter, uh, although one can never be certain about this, but for sure <clears throat> for the small scales and the lower end of the inertial range, it does seem to matter uh, very significantly. And this is something we've written a few papers on 
um, and uh, um, if you um, have never, not had a chance to look at them, I can at least give you some references. Yes, please, I would be happy. Yeah, to. and there is one um, uh, with P.K. Young and uh, Steve Pope, he wrote in Physics of uh, uh, Physical Review Fluids, which talked about this and how one may be able to fix it for very high Reynolds numbers. Because initially we thought if you resolve Kolmogorov scale, everything is fine. And so the increasing computing power made more and more uh, higher and higher Reynolds number possible. But it looks like it's not a such a simple thing. You win, but you don't win as much as you thought you would win. And this is the same uh, in experiments as well, in my view. Of course, in experiments, as you know, everybody designs the experiments or uh, I'm exaggerating a little bit. At least that's what I used to do. Design the conditions such that uh, the smallest scale I can measure is uh, managed to be Kolmogorov scale. And uh, of course, that's not enough for uh, very high uh, gradients and high order moments, etc. Yes, I know. We are actually trying to design an experiment where where we go below the Kolmogorov scale. Yeah, yeah. It is quite you, you have to, I think, if you want to look at the fine scales. And there are people uh, like Gregory Ayank who tells me I'm solving the wrong problem because if you go to such small scales, thermal noise will begin to matter. And therefore, the physics is going to be very different. It may very well be true, but I think it is legitimate to ask what is the structure for the Navier-Stokes equations itself, independent of what physics it tries to emulate? Yes, I agree. Hello, oh, Srini. Uh, yeah, yeah my, my question is related to the small scale. Uh, I mean, I was curious. Uh, is there any physical interpretation for this small scale? Or, uh, in other words, can we arrive to estimate this scale from dimensional arguments? Uh, uh, what would be the reasoning? Uh, so in fact, um, uh, say uh, three quarters that uh, Kolmogorov has is something you can do very simply by dimensional arguments. It's sort of like what you would uh, do from the mean field theory in uh, critical phenomena, but any other power um, of the sort you, you measure, which is deviations from uh, Landau's uh, critical phenomena, et cetera. Now, you, you, you don't have a theory for this, um, except through renormalization. And uh, then, and there are internal relations that they, uh, various exponents are to satisfy. There is no such theory for, for this, except what I, um, and Victor claim we, we have, um, and uh, I'm writing a paper with him now, uh, ex trying to explain this. But basically, um, uh, you have the smallest scales, um, the smallest scales such that however small the scale it is, if you take the velocity difference across that, it, it, the Reynolds number unity that descri describes for you the velocity uh, difference across a, the jump across a smaller scale. And you have to match it with the, with the, um, with the scaling part, that is the, um, the, uh, the anomalous part. So by making this matching, you actually can come up with an expression. But that's not what you asked. You asked what is the physical, physical thing, but this may be physical as well, but this is about the best I can give you. Thank you. Uh, uh, oh, Enrico, I have another question? Uh, it's fine. Uh, fine for me. Uh, I'd like to push to push this uh, this question a little bit further. Uh, I may not understand very well that all the theory behind your your, your the, the the issue of the small scales, but um, I'd like to suggest a picture, and I, I'd like you to just to comment on this picture and tell me how uh, wrong it is. Um, if if the small scales actually depend on the Reynolds number means that they are somewhat, somehow uh, sensitive to what happens at large scales. And uh, so could you imagine that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, velocity differences at large scales um, somehow manage to uh, 
to uh, which of course are at at gradient lengths that are large, uh, somehow manage to to get their way through the uh, the initial cascade and uh, steepen their gradient all to all the way to the uh, Kolmogorov scale where, where they basically uh, uh, dissipate with a uh, uh, shock like uh, 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 picture as you as you mentioned at one point yeah. in your, in your, in, your yeah. in your lecture yeah. so uh, in this in which case uh, well you would get uh, a part of the dissipation which would uh, somehow bypass the uh, Kolmogorov cascade yes you are a hundred percent right. <clears throat> and in fact, <clears throat> we wrote uh, another paper in JFM um, about this. So you are a hundred percent right that as most of the time, perhaps uh, it goes through a cascade, the energy um, from the large scale, but there are uh, instances where it will just bypass the whole thing. And it is related to the, uh, the strength of your forcing. If the forcing is let's say um, uh, gentle, uh, then of course it is uh, like the regular cascade and you don't have this problem. But if it is, if the forcing is such that sometimes it is uh, gentle, like, um, you know, a Gaussian uh, variable, but sometimes you have very large uh, forcing, then what you mentioned is the important way in which the energy flux occurs. And that is the one that you see at this very smaller scales. And in fact, the smallest scales are extremely intermittent, unlike uh, what you might think, viscosity somehow kills it off and so everything is smooth, but it is not. In fact, um, there are uh, parts where, which are inherited by, by the very large scales and you have an extremely intermittent signal. So you have to average over long, long times and things of that sort. So your picture is 100% accurate, but it, I can send you the reference to this paper but you can uh, look up uh, if you want, JFM, uh, about a year or so ago. Well, I'm one of the authors. Uh, Diago Danzas is another, uh, uh, and uh, Stale um, is the third author. So this is the part that people like Jim Brosseur and others um, had really thought about or been thinking about in terms of triadic interactions. <coughs> which started with Stan Corson. But the thing is they were looking at individual triads, but I am talking about the integrated effect over all possible triads. And that's the part that uh, is different from um, what has been done before. So you are, you are absolutely right. Thank you very much. Um, could I ask a question on the, um, uh, hi Srini. Hi, I haven't seen you for so uh, long. No, I've been hiding out, enjoying uh, my uh, yeah. Walden Pond season, yeah, like so many also, people. Also growing a beard. Yeah, this way people don't accuse me of dyeing my hair anymore. <laughs> so my question is, the physical picture we've been discussing of the influence of large scales and cascade bypass, it seems it should have important uh, time domain signatures because it should involve, I would think, a very rapid sort of a motion in order to compress from large to small scales. Yeah, uh, yeah. Any, has there been any investigation of that? Um, mostly um, we looked at the wave number picture, uh, not the time, I have to remember. Um, let, let me think about this. Uh, I will, I owe you an answer on this. Uh, uh, but most of the work, certainly the one we published is on the wave number. But I'll try to see if there is any time uh, time domain analysis. Okay, Alan, I will do that. Send it to you. Thank you. If I find anything. Good. Thank you. Hello, Srini. I'll try to ask my question. <laughs> Thank you, you, uh, you gave a, a picture of a voltage sheet at some point. Well, you think uh, just a possibility, yeah. And then uh, you said that the velocity fluctuation across it would be u zero, which is the large eddy. Right, right. In which case, I guess the thickness of the sheet would be nu over u zero, which may or may not be related to your. Uh, yeah, no, the thickness is related to uh, some a variety of small scale. It have to be any fixed thing because the exponent for me will always go to zero 
when p is very large. So it may be some small r, it may be a smaller scale, maybe intermediate scale. Sometimes you see large excursions over a variety of scales. I think that's the point I'm making. But the smallest scale is indeed new over u0, which might be the case if you have these sheets that you might have there. New, new or u0 is one possibility, yeah, sure. Okay, then if you want to estimate the dissipation rate, you will write viscosity times u0 squared. No, 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 you don't want to do that because these are not um, uh, the ones that will give you uh, the dissipation because these are very infrequent, but very high uh, amplitude uh, fluctuations. So if you are looking at mean value of the dissipation, that's not where it is coming from. They are coming from uh, uh, the usual fluctuations that uh, we, we know. So the, the, you cannot do it like that. Okay, that's still interesting what you say because you might, you're probably right. But if you do the calculator, I was doing it when you were talking, viscosity times u0 squared yeah. over that scale, which is new u0 squared. Yeah. yeah. Multiply this by the volume fraction that comes from the fact that the vortex sheet has a yeah. r squared over times this yeah. thickness. Yeah. Yeah. Then you obtain the Taylor scaling of dissipation. Yeah, um, that may be. I, I will check that, but I don't uh, disbelieve you at all. Maybe the, like uh, I don't disbelieve you at all on that. The I'm making is that uh, what you say can be done, but these large fluctuations do not occur over large volumes. They appear on small volumes. And so their contributions are very large if you're looking at large moments, but not for low order moments. I think that's the thing you have to keep in mind. But uh, if that is, uh, we can work it out, I'm pretty sure. I, I had it in no, mind, but... in the, by the way, because I took a very small volume fraction, multiplied, yeah, yeah. nothing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So on the vortex sheet thing, uh, what I um, uh, speculate is that um, it's punctured vortex sheet very often, and uh, the um, and uh, I can't say much more than that in physical terms. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So is, uh, are there any more questions? Once again, just feel free to, to unmute your mic if you want to ask a question or uh, you can write it in the, in the chat and then we'll report it. Yeah, I, I can also answer by email. Oh, that's great. Okay, yeah. so that's, that yeah. does not seem to, to be the case. Oh. Thank, thank you, Francesco. So thanks for the, for the great talk and for uh, uh, answering so many questions. As you saw that uh, your, your talk triggered quite an interesting discussion. And uh, uh, thanks uh, again for having given the, the, the seminar today. Okay, great. Thank you. And the greetings to all the friends who are um, on the audience. Uh, some of them are still hanging around, so, <laughs> but they're slowly disappearing. So I should close here. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Oh, Thanks once right. again. I hope okay. to see you all next week. Okay. Good evening. Bye. Bye. Bye.